history, uh, we've gone from 1620 through seven, you know, 16, oh, 76 or so, 1776, 1788, 1793, 1800, and now we are coming to 1803, the core of discovery, Lewis and Clark's Expedition West. Um, I am delighted to have as our guests, I should say, I'm David Randall, Director of Research, National Association of Scholars. But more importantly, uh, our guests are Harry Fritz, Professor Emeritus of History at the University of Montana. And his uh, publications include the Lewis and Clark Expedition. Sexy um, title. James Holmberg, Curator of the Filson Historical Society, um, which include, includes uh, into the Wilderness, the Lewis and Clark Expedition. <laughs> and then uh, Robert J. Miller, Professor of Law at the Sandra Day O'Connor School of Law at Arizona State University, um, whose books include Native America, Discovered and Conquered, Thomas Jefferson, Lewis and Clark, and Manifest Destiny. No, I've only chosen some of the titles which have Lewis and Clark Expedition in them. Uh, they have a long and distinguished publishing record, which I believe will be put into the chat button uh, for people to see below. Now that brings me to the next thing of what's happening. The schedule is going to be a short presentation, perhaps 12 to 15 minutes, I believe, uh, from each of the uh, presenters uh, in alphabetical order by last name. There will then be moderated conversation ideally sparked as much as possible by the questions which you, the digital audience, are going to provide. And you can provide them by either going to the chat button or the questions and answers button. Both of them are at the bottom of the screen. Uh, type in, um, they will be answered, if not directly by the uh, panelists, and they have the option to do that, uh, then by me. And I'll simply pass along um, the questions, not in the order they're received, simply in the order that seems like it's the most fun and that will stimulate the best conversation. Now, fear not. If you don't get to your questions by the end, send me an email, randall at nas.org, R-A-N-D-A-L-L -L at nas.org. I will pass along your questions to the panelists so they can answer them at their leisure later. Um, and also, do not worry about a chance to see this uh, again. This will be posted to the National Association of Scholars YouTube channel, uh, usually within 24 hours. So all you need to do is do the, that happy Google search, National Association of Scholars YouTube, not NAS YouTube. That will get you a rapper named NAS, who is not us. Um, so that's what we're doing. And having said all that, post haste, I believe the first person will speak is uh, Professor Fritz. So I'll begin. If we're, if we're focusing on the year 1803, uh, we are dealing with the origins of the Lewis and Clark expedition. Uh, and I wanna begin with uh, Thomas Jefferson's instructions to uh, Meriwether Lewis, be, because they were based uh, on the geographic knowledge or the lack of geographic knowledge about the American West, uh, there were at the time two uh, sort of armchair geographic theories about the American West. One of them was that the West was a mirror image of the East. The Mississippi River divided the continent in half and the West looked like the East. In the east, the Appalachian Mountains are more or less a single uh, chain of mountains and they can be crossed uh, through numerous passes uh, in half a day's horseback ride. And so the assumption was that the Rocky Mountains, and they weren't all that clear about where uh, the Rockies were, but they knew there had to be some kind of continental divide uh, out west. The assumption was uh, that the Rockies were uh, like the Appalachians, a single chain of mountains that could be easily uh, crossed. And the other geographic theory uh, was that all the great rivers of the West uh, began in the same location, the same pyramid of land or the same height of land. Uh, so if you tracked one river to its source, you would also be at the source uh, 
uh, of all the other great rivers. If you track the Missouri River to its source, you would be at the source uh, of the Columbia River, uh, of the Colorado River, uh, and numerous other uh, bodies of, uh, of water. And so that's, you need to understand that, I think, to figure out Jefferson's instructions uh, to Meriwether Lewis, which were to track the Missouri River to its source and then get on the Columbia and head down to the Pacific. So the assumption was that once he got to the source of the Missouri River, uh, he would also be at the headwaters of the Columbia River uh, and they could make an easy uh, passage uh, down, to the, uh, down to the Pacific. Uh, those two geographic theories uh, were exploded by the Lewis and Clark uh, expedition. Uh, and they were exploded uh, mostly right here in my home state of Montana, Montana and uh, Idaho. Um, when Montana was created, uh, it left uh, Idaho as one of the weirdest looking uh, states in the uh, nation with that ungainly northern uh, panhandle. Uh, my suggestion for the bicentennial was that Montana should annex the Idaho uh, panhandle uh, to create a single Lewis and Clark geographic uh, uh, site. Uh, but if you look at a, if you look at a map uh, of the expedition uh, heading west in 1805, from the middle of North Dakota to the mouth of the Columbia River, it's, it's more or less a straight line, uh, a few uh, wiggles uh, here and there uh, going from east to west. But then if you look at the map of the expedition, the route that the expedition took, uh, it goes way off that line uh, here in Montana because they took Thomas Jefferson's instructions literally to track the Missouri River to its source. Uh, and that got them, after they passed the Great Falls of the Missouri, uh, the Missouri River does not flow from the west. Uh, it actually flows from the south, and it flows from the east of south in some uh, areas. Uh, so in uh, July and August of 1805, the expedition is getting further away from the Pacific Ocean, further away from the mouth of the, uh, of the Columbia. Uh, and uh, when they finally reach uh, what Meriwether Lewis called the headwaters uh, of the Missouri River, uh, geologists don't agree with that today, but it's close uh, enough. They were nowhere near uh, the headwaters of the Columbia River. Uh, they still had uh, 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 mountain ranges uh, to pass. Uh, it was getting in the in the winter time. Uh, crossing the Bitterroot Mountains in September of 1805 uh, in a wetter and colder climate uh, than we experience uh, today uh, was the closest, I think, that the expedition ever came to perishing uh, in the uh, American West because they were without food, uh, without uh, winter uh, clothing, uh, and survived mainly by killing and eating several uh, of, their, uh, of their horses. Uh, so they discovered uh, that the Rocky Mountains were not a single chain of mountains. In fact, in this area, uh, there are over a hundred separately named chains of mountains, uh, and they're from 250 to 300 miles wide uh, in the, at this uh, latitude. So my bottom line is that the most spectacular uh, geographic success of the Lewis and Clark expedition uh, was getting through the Rockies, over the Rockies, around the Rockies, um, over to Columbia River uh, headquarters around Kamii, Idaho, the Clearwater uh, River. Uh, and it's a spectacular geographic discovery, um, appears on the map that maps that William Clark drew uh, of the, uh, of the uh, expedition. Uh, and when uh, Meriwether Lewis uh, got back to St. Louis in September of 1806 and wrote to Thomas Jefferson, he said, we have discovered the shortest and most practical route between the headwaters of the Missouri and the headwaters of the, of the Columbia. Uh, he then went on to describe a passage by land of 340 miles 
Uh, that's the Northwest Passage, 340 miles overland. Of this, he said, 200 miles were along a pretty good road. That's an Indian trail from Great Falls to Lolo, Montana, and 140 miles over tremendous mountains whose tops are covered with eternal snows. So the dream of explorers from Columbus to 1805 uh, died in western Montana and northern Idaho uh, when the Lewis and Clark expedition discovered that there was no waterway through the continent to the Pacific. They discovered the truth, the awesome truth about the Rocky Mountains and about the rivers uh, of the West. Is that my 12 minutes? Yes, I guess so then, sorry. Thank Close you. Enough. Close enough. I, <clears throat> I, I am uh, emerging from my muted status. Uh, thank you so much. Um, for Dr. Holmberg, if you would be kind enough to go next then. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, I, I like the 1803 date uh, because uh, it's really quite accurate for when the expedition began. The Lewis and Clark expedition didn't spring from nothing at the mouth of the Missouri River in May of 1804, there's a very important planning, supply, recruitment, and training periods uh, for what historians call the greatest exploring venture in the history of the United States. Uh, before Lewis and Clark headed off into the relatively unknown American West, uh, they had to be ready to go. They had to have the right men, the right training, the right kind of equipment, and what have you. And this was all happening in the east. So there's the west of the Mississippi and up the Missouri to the Pacific Western legacy that we really refer to it as it now. And then there's a very important crucial beginning phases called the Eastern legacy. And that's what I want to kind of talk about is what was going on, uh, especially on the Ohio River uh, in 1803 that really laid the foundation for the success of the Corps of Discovery. You know, St. Louis, uh, in many respects, has, has uh, good credit for saying that the expedition began there. Uh, Lewis was there in the winter of, of 1803 and 04, uh, gathering intelligence and making arrangements and what have you. A lot of it was actually going, going on on the Illinois side of the Mississippi, 18 miles to the north at Wood River. Uh, or Camp Dubois, Du Bois, as it's, as it's called. Uh, but what else, is, again, is going on in 1803? Well, let's look at the falls of the Ohio. Uh, and that's where I'm here in Louisville, Kentucky, and across the river in Clarksville, Indiana. It was actually in Louisville on October 14th, 1803, that Lewis and Clark rendezvoused to form one of the most famous partnerships in American history and in exploring history. Uh, they spent almost the next two weeks going back and forth between Clarksville, where they established a base camp either at or near the Clark Farm, uh, there at the lower end of the Falls of the Ohio in Clarksville, and across to Louisville, back and, back and forth, uh, making final preparations. We don't really know why there was a two-week delay. Clark had been waiting on Lewis for some two months. Uh, to arrive. They'd been corresponding. They said they were going to meet in Louisville. Uh, Clark expected them by late August, uh, but due to low river conditions and a delay in the keelboat being built uh, up at uh, Pittsburgh, uh, Lewis was, was very late uh, getting to the, the falls of the Ohio. Well, when, when Clark received Lewis's letter of invitation in July, of, of 1803. You think the mail might be kind of slow nowadays. You know, back then it took a long time to get where it was going. And Lewis's letter to Clark took almost a month to the day to actually arrive. Uh, and he immediately wrote back and said he'd be happy to join him as co-commander, uh, equal in every respect as he, he put it. Lewis also asked him to begin recruiting men because they knew that an army didn't travel on its stomach 
uh, or an army does travel on its stomach, so to speak. This was an army expedition, and there's no way they could bring all the supplies they needed uh, for what would be at least a two-year expedition and maybe longer. And so Clark set about recruiting the best woodsmen, hunters, the frontiersmen in the area. And he, he knew these many of these guys he already knew from living in the area. And these nine men, he recruited seven uh, here at the falls and Lewis brought two down the river with him. And these were the first enlisted men of the expedition. And they really formed that nucleus of the Corps of Discovery, the, the all important foundation upon which the success of the Corps was built. And Clark famously dubbed these guys, the nine young men from Kentucky. Well, let's not, you know, let's not bother with the facts and be exactly accurate because not all of them were actually from Kentucky, but that's where they were enlisted. That's where most of them were from. Uh, and that's how he thought of them in, in his mind. And the names really bear repeating just so everybody knows who these, these foundation old men were uh, that Clark and, and Lewis put together here at the falls. Charles Floyd, brothers Reuben and Joseph Field, John Coulter, who becomes the, the father of the mountain man, uh, well known out there in Montana. William Bratton, George Gibson, and George Shannon. Those are the two that came down river with, uh, with Lewis. John Shields and Nathaniel Hale Pryor. Lewis and Clark gave compliments sparingly and it was this group that got most of the compliments after the expedition for the service that they had given. Two of the three sergeants, Floyd and Pryor, were uh, among this, were coming from this group. Uh, they happened to be first cousins too. They were, they were related. Uh, John Shields, although he was married, he was a blacksmith and a gunsmith in addition to being an excellent hunter. And Clark, being the practical man he was, knew that they had to have somebody along that could fix their weapons and do some smithy work uh, for the expedition. And so he made arrangements, uh, despite Lewis's caution not to recruit married men, he recruited Shields, who was indeed married at the time and had a child. Uh, Clark made arrangements to have his wife helped out if she needed it during the time that they would be gone. Floyd's fate, of course, as I think we all know, was to be the only member of the expedition to die in August of 1804 near present Sioux City, Iowa, uh, from apparently a, the results of a ruptured appendix. And uh, ironically, uh, the man who didn't make the whole trip has the largest monument. Uh, that's what boosterism will, will do for you. A very important member of the expedition and someone who did not get a land grant, did not get extra pay for uh, the double pay that others did was William Clark's enslaved African-American York. Uh, he probably did not have a choice about going. Uh, Clark probably said, come on York, you're going with me. You've been at my side since we were little boys. Uh, you've been on my other travels and uh, you're going to make not only camp life easier, but you were raised on the frontier just like me and you can do everything I can do. You can hunt, you can track, you can handle boats, you can handle horses. You can actually swim as the journals have, have revealed to us. Uh, what wasn't known at the time, I don't think the captains at all, even this occurred to them, was that because of the color of York skin, uh, he would help promote the expedition and really propel the expedition uh, because of some of the native people's reaction to him. In fact, being, being called by the Arikara and the man Dan, big medicine. They thought he was very spiritually powerful. So this was the all important nucleus of the Corps of Discovery, the crucial foundation upon which the rest of the expedition was, was built. Uh, and it was, we all know, if your foundation is flawed, things can go wrong and go bad and things can collapse, but it didn't. It was this core of the core uh, that pushed off from Clarksville on October 26, 1803, down the Ohio and into history. Lewis, Clark, the nine young men, York, 
And we can't forget Lewis's faithful and very talented Newfoundland dog, Seaman, who is also part of this group. Now, as they went down the Ohio, their next major stop, and the one we know about, was at Fort Massac, near present Metropolis, Illinois, uh, essentially across the river from present Paducah, Kentucky, which William Clark would found in 1827. And it was at Fort Massac that they were supposed to meet some more recruits coming from Southwest Point in East Tennessee, but they had failed to show up. And so what they did was they hired a young hunter and woodsman named George Druyard, who was a French Canadian and Shawnee parentage, who was a hunter and interpreter and courier working out of Massac. Uh, he'd been raised after the family had moved from Ohio uh, to the Cape Girardeau area. Uh, he'd been raised on that far edge of the frontier and he was very, very talented, very good at what he did. They hired him to go find these missing recruits in Tennessee, which he did, and he delivered them to the Wood River camp in December of 1803. Uh, but what they also did is they hired him as an interpreter because he knew some Indian dialects and sign language, and of course was a very good hunter and, and tracker and uh, really next to the captains, he was probably the most important member of the Corps. Other 1803 loca locales that can be talked about is of course, Pittsburgh. I mentioned Pittsburgh, that's where the keel boat or maybe we should say the barge is currently being debated today, uh, depending upon the shape of its hull, uh, whether it was a true keel boat or barge. This is an example of how information keeps turning up and is debated and learned about today. But it was from Pittsburgh after a month and a half delay for Lewis and getting the boat built uh, that he set off in, on August 31st with that temporary party and a few recruits. Other locations, Harper's Ferry, West Virginia, Philadelphia, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Washington, DC, and Monticello. You know, they all claim a, an important role in that preparation, training, education of Lewis, supply uh, that, that was so important to the, the success of the expedition. Uh, if we wanna talk about where things began, everybody likes to, to you know, be a booster for their area, but ultimately it goes back to the mind of Thomas Jefferson. And this is something that Harry was talking about with the whole geographic principles of the day and, and what was believed. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, going back as far as the 1780s, had actually tried to get William Clark's older brother, Revolutionary War hero, George Rogers Clark, to lead an expedition into that vast unknown West. Uh, Clark turned him down, a couple of other efforts never really got off the ground. And finally though, as president in the early 1800s, Jefferson was in a position to make this happen. And, and he did. And of course, you know, all these questions, again, Harry mentioned the geographic beliefs of the time of the, of the West being a mirror of the East. You know, but was, uh, what about the Welsh Indians? This legend that still persists today of this tribe of Welshmen that had come over hundreds of years earlier or the lost tribe of Israel, the Northwest Passage, which uh, Lewis and Clark did disprove that there was no true easy way to go across the continent. Uh, with those mountains in the way. Did mastodons or mammoths still roam? Mountains of salt, all these kinds of things. And Jefferson and other government officials, scientists, medical men of the day provided a long list, really beyond what, what the, the, the men could accomplish on the expedition to try to learn. But it was a major, major information gathering, data collection, specimen gathering, uh, successful effort on, behalf, on uh, the part of the Corps of Discovery and especially of the captains. So 1803 was a critical year from Congress authorizing the seed money for the undertaking, cost overrun. Uh, we all know how that government often works today. The 2,500 seed money uh, grew to some 40,000 or more dollars in the end uh, to truly fund what was, what was done. Uh, Lewis and Clark laying the groundwork for its success as they needed to, to spend the money and get what they needed. 
the captains returned east in 1806. That's another part of the, the Eastern legacy. Uh, returning to Louisville on November 5th after arriving in St. Louis on September 23rd, discharging the men in October, uh, selling off the, the surplus. Don't you wish we had those in a national museum today uh, from the expedition? And then continuing eastward, Lewis right away with the Mandan delegation, Pierre Chouteau with the Osage delegation that they came east with from St. Louis. Uh, Clark and York stayed until mid-December visiting family, and then they headed to and reunited in Washington. So this crucial beginning of the expedition was recognized by the federal government in March of 2019, when legislation was signed to officially extend the Lewis and Clark National Historic Trail from the Wood River St. Louis area all the way eastward to Pittsburgh, taking in that stretch of the Mississippi South from Wood River St. Louis to the mouth of the Ohio, and then up the entire length of the Ohio to Pittsburgh, uh, in all some 1,200 miles uh, of additional trail. And this is a true reflection of after years, so some 20 years of, of working with the government and trying to, to, to have this happen, uh, recognition of that very important Eastern legacy uh, that occurred in 1803 and even afterwards in 1806 and, and, and beyond. And without that solid foundation laid in the East in 1803, who knows what might've happened in the West. Thank you so much. Um, I am going to go more quickly this time up. Uh, professor Miller, may I ask you to go next? Thank you very much. Uh, I am a law professor and I am a citizen of the Eastern Shawnee tribe of Oklahoma. So in my book and certainly in my short talk today, I'm going to focus a bit on the law, but specifically look at Lewis and Clark's interactions with the Indian nations. And then ultimately we're supposed to address these three questions. Did Lewis, what did Lewis and Clark set out to do? Did they succeed and what's the impact today? So I'll be thinking about this from the status of indigenous peoples and the Indian nations in the US. Um, a very brief background and what was Thomas Jefferson thinking and what did he know he was doing when he sent the Lewis and Clark expedition west? Uh, uh, Jefferson was an attorney. He understood international law and he understood national claims to new territories. So this goes to what Professor Fritz was mentioning. Why did they travel the Missouri River and not take, I believe, Professor Fritz, you said a more direct route. Well, Jefferson understood international law and, your, and countries claim territories based on the drainage system of rivers. Jefferson wrote a 40 page pamphlet after the purchase of Louisiana territory called the limits and boundaries of Louisiana. So he directed Meriwether Lewis to follow and track the Mississippi and then that branch, the Missouri River as far north as possible because that's the lands the United States would be claiming under international law that today we call the doctrine of discovery. So Lewis took that route, and if you notice on a map, the Missouri River watershed, part of it is up into modern day Canada. So I guess we did not successfully claim all the lands uh, encompassed by the river. But I think very plainly, that's why they stuck to the river. It was easier to travel, of course, I suppose, and they were following Jefferson's instructions. But what did Jefferson think of the peoples that were out there, the nations? What did the law tell him and what did just pragmatics tell him? Well, European countries have always dealt with indigenous peoples in North America through treaties. The United States did the same thing. Our colonies, our states, and then the various forms of United States government we had have signed hundreds of treaties with, in, with Indian nations, trying to keep the peace, trying to define what is Indian country, the lands that tribal governments governed, how Europeans would, and later Americans, would trade with Indian nations. The King of England even drew a line in North America across the Appalachia and Allegheny Mountains in 1763. It's called the Royal Proclamation of 1763. 
and defined everything to the West in essence as Indian country. And once the United States had a government, we drew a similar line in 1783. And what was west of that line was presumed to be Indian country. And the, if the United States wanted to trade there, if the United States wanted to buy land there, it had to be done by treaties under Article VI of the Constitution. So Jefferson, don't forget he was a lawyer, practicing lawyer before he became a full-time professor, a uh, full-time politician. And he knew this background in his mind. And so what I wanna focus on is what I'm pretty certain everyone accepts are the primary four objectives of the Lewis and Clark expedition that Jefferson wrote down and that Jefferson argued. So first off, I wanna focus on the secret message he sent the Congress, January 18, 1803. It was secret because we were talking about stealing the fur trade from England. And in that message, Jefferson wouldn't even use the word England. He said, we can get the fur trade from that other country. So one of the most, if not the most lucrative trade in the world at that time was the fur trade to China. And Jefferson told Congress in this secret message, January 18, 1803, you should fund this expedition I want to send west. Now focus on that. So this is law. Jefferson was asking for federal funding and he thought he had to justify it under the Constitution. So how did he justify it? Under Article I, Section 8, what today we call the Commerce Clause. And so Jefferson said, oh, this expedition isn't just to find out the flora and fauna, which was maybe Jefferson's own personal interest. No, this had a geopolitical, uh, a diplomatic uh, intention, and it was commerce. And so Jefferson told the Congress, we can find this Northwest Passage, we can uh, conduct trade more expeditiously with China than can that other country, that England. And he said, you can give federal dollars to fund this expedition under your commerce power, under Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution. So here's a little twist of law that Jefferson was using and justifying uh, the United States Congress appropriating federal dollars to pay for the expedition. He also told Congress, well, obviously we will interact with native peoples out there. And he even tried to bring up more of the Commerce Clause issue. He said, we will trade with Indian peoples. We will find out what they want to buy from us. And we will find out where they would like us to build trading posts. Let me take you one step back. General uh, President Washington in 1795 proposed to Congress and they passed an act to conduct federal trading posts across the American frontier. From 1795 to 1822, Congress literally ran trading 28 different trading posts. And so the U.S. had long been involved in trade with Indian people for several reasons, just to try to make some money off it try to attract Indian peoples as customers to United States commerce and away from the Hudson Bay and the Canadians and the English. So Jefferson had several even economic ideas in his mind. But now if I get talking too long, someone's gonna have to stop me because I can get rolling. But let me now really get to the letter. So after what Jefferson told Congress in January of 1803, he now writes this famous letter of instructions to Meriwether Lewis on June 20, 1803. And he sets out very clearly three objectives for the expedition. Number one, find that Northwest Passage, open that fur trade with China. Number two, he says clearly, create American commerce with the Indian peoples and the Indian nations that you will surely encounter. Had you ever thought of this? Why did they take those gifts along, folks? Lewis and Clark even prepared in advance, I believe it's five gift bundles for five specific tribes they thought they knew they would encounter. Jefferson mentioned only one, the Teton Sioux, but they knew of certain tribal groups and nations out there that they would encounter. And they had pre-prepared these uh, gift bundles. 
So why else were they handing out needles and beads? And I, I forget all what they were handing out. They were literally a traveling commercial show to native peoples, what we, the United States could sell you. So why don't you trade with us instead of the Hudson Bay Company and the other Canadians? Now his third purpose, and he does mention this in his letter to Jefferson, of course, was perhaps this personal interest of Jefferson as a man of the enlightenment and a man of science. And he wanted Lewis and Clark to conduct very detailed studies of everything as Jim's already been mentioning, are there dinosaurs out there? Is there a mountain of uh, uh, salt out there? And they were very successful at this. But I want to give you a little twist on this too. They, Jefferson was interested in Indian languages his entire life. He had kept uh, vocabulary lists of Indian languages. And so Lewis and Clark had a list of, I believe, 50 to 100 words that they would ask each tribe they encountered. How do you say this? How do you do this? But they also had what could easily be called military intelligence. They had a long list, a questionnaire, some people call it, and they asked tribes about their population, their warriors, their military tactics, who their enemies and their allies were and what their territories, their claimed areas were. So you could easily call that military uh, intelligence. And they wrote their detailed report and they sent this back. Here's a point most people have probably never heard of. Uh, Clark, I think, is primarily responsible for that report they wrote in the winter of 1804-05 when they were in Mandan, and they sent this in the Mandan, near the Mandan villages, and they sent this report back to Jefferson. One of the key questions that I don't know if Jefferson had proposed it or if just Lewis and Clark thought this up on their own, but they were asking tribes, which of you tribes would be willing to move west of the Mississippi River? So Jefferson was already thinking of what we call Indian removal, the trail of tears many of you might know it as. Which tribes east of the Mississippi could be forced or could be encouraged to move west? My own tribe was one of those trail of tear tribes. The Eastern Shawnee tribe that's now in the very northeast corner of Oklahoma, we came from South Central Ohio in 1832. And George Druyard that Jim mentioned, I'm going to claim him as my relative. He was a Shawnee. And I always say George Druyard was the third most important member of the expedition. I have no idea if I'm related to him, but I'm going to claim it. Okay, so these were Jefferson's three objectives when we had not made the Louisiana Purchase. This was when Jefferson thought Lewis and Clark were going through perhaps English, perhaps French, and certainly across Spanish claimed territory uh, in the West. Find the Northwest Passage, create commerce and trade with the Indian nations, and do some science and, and ethnography, et cetera. But now the United States makes the Louisiana Purchase. What did we really buy? You'll have to read my book. What did we really buy from France? Folks, we did not buy the land. We bought a legal right to be the only entity to buy the land in the future. This is part of this international law I was talking about. Jefferson was well aware of it. He, know, he knew these lands still belonged to the native nations. But now we make the Louisiana purchase. We buy from, remember it went from Spain, Spain to France. And so now from France, we buy this right, property right and sovereignty right in the legal, in the Louisiana territory. Do not think we bought the land folks. We did not. That's a mistake of American history. The United States spent the next hundred years buying land from tribes, fighting wars with some tribes, engaging in treaties with hundreds of tribes out in what's considered the Louisiana territory. But now that we made this Louisiana purchase, Jefferson writes a new letter to Meriwether Lewis on January 22, 1804. Lewis is in the St. Louis area, as Jim said. Jefferson is informing Lewis that there's a new development that impacts what he and Lewis are, are supposed to do. He tells him, we have now purchased or we've now made this treaty with France. <clears throat> We are now the sovereigns there. 
Now I have to go back one step. When Jefferson thought he was sending Lewis and Clark through perhaps French, English and Spanish claimed territory, he had asked the ambassadors of those three countries for passports for Lewis and Clark. The French and the English believed Jefferson's lie and they were dumb enough to give him passports. Now, what was the lie? Remember the three objectives? Jefferson told these foreign ambassadors, oh, I'm only sending them out there for the science and the ethnography. Oh, they're not doing anything political or commercial. So Jefferson lied to those ambassadors. The Spanish were smart enough not to believe him. They did not give passports for Lewis and Clark. And if you know history, they sent four military expeditions out to try to capture Lewis and Clark. Do you remember Lieutenant Zebulon Pike who went west to Pike's Peak? Pike's Peak. How did he get that name? Who knew? Why were the Indians calling it Pike's Peak before Zebulon showed up? The Spanish did arrest Zebulon Pike and held him for many months. Okay, I, I digress. I, I guess I'm almost done here. So what is this fourth objective in this letter of, well, let's see, I hope I didn't mistake the date, uh, January 22, 1804, he says, the French, Spanish, and English are gone. We, the United States, we are now the sovereigns in the Louisiana territory. And he tells Lewis, and I think this is a direct quote, you may more directly propose to the Indian nations I've run out of quote, but that we engage in commerce with them. We are now their fathers. Their old fathers, the French and the Spanish have gone. So did Lewis and Clark carry out these? So I, I've listed these four objectives. I'm looking at my time here. When did I start? I got to wrap up pretty quick, looks like. What did Lewis and Clark do? They held over 50 diplomatic conferences, I call it, with tribal nations, two and three day conferences, and delivered this message. You can read the 2,500 word speech that Lewis wrote down, it's in the journals, and he and Clark say they delivered that message really to every tribe they encountered. what they tell them? Your old fathers are gone, we, the United States, are your new fathers and friends. You better listen to what we say. You better trade only with us. And of course, they handed out the famous sovereignty tokens. If you've never heard that phrase, it was the Jefferson medals that they handed out, the flags, American flags, and even American, some American military uniforms. And historians call these sovereignty tokens. The United States, we didn't think this up first. The English, the French, and Spanish had been handing out these medals of their kings for decades, if not centuries. And Lewis and Clark tell these chiefs, you got to get rid of those old ones. We are your sovereigns now. And then they'd be handing out these military, these tokens, excuse me, sovereignty tokens of Jefferson, et cetera. I do think I've ran over my time, but that, I guess that's about all I wanted to say. So it looks like Lewis and Clark very accurately carried out the instructions that Jefferson gave them. Thank you so much. And, you know, and of course, we should all arbitrarily you know, interrupt you during the discussion or something to make up for any extra minute you might have taken. Um, so to everybody who's been listening, please do put in more questions uh, in the chat or the question answer button. And I'll just start with, um, oh, well, uh, no one has yet mentioned Sac Sacagawea. At what point did they encounter her and how significant was her role? Um, to any of you and all of you. Well, they, they encountered Sacagawea and her uh, husband Toussaint Charbonneau uh, in the Mandan villages in 1804. And uh, I think that she is more important than he is. Uh, they hired him as an interpreter, and he knew the Hidatsa language, and he knew French. He didn't know English, but Sacagawea knew Shoshone. And the expedition, when they arrived in the Mandan villages in the fall of 1804, learned quickly that the last Indian tribe they would encounter on the plains before they struck the Rocky Mountains were the Shoshone, and they would need friendly relations in order to get uh, some help with their baggage and buy some horses. And so Sacagawea was the key. She was the entree to the uh, Shoshone. Uh, 
And I believe uh, that uh, Toussaint uh, at one point said he didn't, he'd go along, but he wouldn't do any work. I believe they would have left him behind if it came to that and taken Sacagawea, who turned out to be of pivotal importance when, of course, the chief of the Shoshone turned out to be her brother. And how, how typical is it that that they wanted uh, Sakakawea to come along. And so what do they do? They hired her husband. You know, he's the one that got paid and then she was along for the ride. And, uh, and also as a woman, she was considered many times a sign of peace, but a woman with a baby was, a, was always a sign of peace. War parties didn't have, have a, a woman with a baby along. And so, and so Lewis and Clark also used that to their advantage. I agree with those comments and really have nothing more to add. I think in some senses we overemphasize her role, but as Professor Fritz came at the right time, she was absolutely crucial. And if you read the journal, she did guide them a little bit when she started recognizing that area that she was from. But I, when we talk about that she guides the expedition like all the time, I think that's what Americans all think. And it does not seem that's historically accurate. There are more, more statues to Sacagawea throughout the West than to any other American woman. <laughs> but Professor Miller, I, would, I, wanna, I just want to mention that uh, many years ago, I had an Indian student in uh, my history classes who told me over and over again, never use the term Western lands. The proper term is tribal lands. <laughs> and I've tried to live up to that ever since. Well, you could call the whole continent that, Harry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but that's the point you made. With tribal lands, and we had to buy them or seize them or acquire them somehow. Yes. So I am going to get, there are two questions about the uh, Blackfeet. Um, could you talk about what happened with the Blackfeet on the way back is one, and then from Joe LeBlanc. Um, being from South Louisiana, this is fascinating stuff. I actually say it's fascinating from wherever you are at. Uh, but did Lewis and Clark encounter the Blackfeet in their travels? If so, would they have traveled into Canada? Well, they, uh, the expedition, not the whole expedition, but just Lewis and three other members of the expedition uh, encountered the Blackfeet Indians on the way home, on the way back in 1806. Um, the whole return trip is much less well studied and uh, analyzed than the trip out. Uh, but I think uh, as far as Meriwether Lewis is concerned, it's equally as important. Uh, he was a different uh, person on the way back than, than on the way out. And his expedition up the Marias River uh, into known Blackfeet Indian country uh, and he had stigmatized the Blackfeet uh, already as a vicious, lawless, and abandoned set of wretches. Uh, and here he goes with only three men uh, and no reserves in his rear, really, into known hostile Blackfeet uh, Indian country uh, in uh, 18, 1806. And he runs into a group of about eight Blackfeet probably teenage uh, boys, uh, and there is a, a fracas uh, the next day uh, in which two Blackfeet are, are, are killed, uh, and Lewis and his men got out of there in a hurry. Uh, but the Blackfeet um, were the first Northern Plains tribe to acquire guns, maybe the last to acquire horses because they came from the South but the first to acquire guns because they came from the East and the Blackfeet were largely a Canadian uh, tribe and they had established trade relations uh, with the Cree Indians and with French and British uh, uh, merchants in the East. So they were, they were resistant to Lewis's argument about trade uh, and uh, uh, commerce and they were hostile because Lewis bragged uh, about providing guns to their enemies, the Shoshone and other Plains uh, tribes. So relations between the Blackfeet uh, and the United States uh, were at a low ebb for a generation after Lewis and Clark. Uh, 
Well, and also, and to add to what, what Harry just said, too, you know, this is an example of Meriwether Lewis showing some poor judgment uh, and his risk-taking personality in some respects. Uh, but the three men that he had with him are part of this Ohio River group, George Druyard and Reuben and Joseph Field. Uh, and if there was ever a dangerous and risky undertaking that one of the captains was going to go on, those are, are one or two or even three of these were the men they would choose, which again shows the value. And in that fight that occurred that, that early morning in July of 1806, uh, Reuben uh, knifed and killed one of the Blackfeet warriors. And, uh, and then Lewis is, is shot and is believed to have killed the second and uh, and and Lewis left behind a calling card and he throw a peace medal or something on one of the Indians and and uh, and then they took off and and reunited back down on the Missouri but that that caused yeah lasting enmity and hostility between the Americans and the Blackfeet and ultimately in some ways the Blackfeet uh, as the American mountain men moved west and into that region, they were impeccable foes. And uh, not very many years later, the Blackfeet, you can say, kind of got their revenge in that they killed George Druyard in, I think it was April of 1810. They killed John Potts, who was one of the members. He was trapping with John Coulter uh, uh, in that area, the Three Forks area. And then of course, John Coulter's famous run and escape from the Blackfeet you know, is one of the first major mountain male, uh, mountain man kind of hero tales that are often told uh, of his run to get away from the Blackfeet. And they probably killed, I think, one, maybe two other expedition members in later years when they went west. It was only when a, a trader from the American Fur Company, John Jacob Astor's Monopoly, uh, married a Blackfeet woman, uh, that uh, relations uh, simmered down a little. But that was in the 1830s. Thank you. I'm going to go to another question. Um, is it true that Lewis was looking for mammoths? Mammoth fossils have been discovered. Religious orthodoxy held that what God had created must still exist. Therefore, mammoths must live somewhere, and west of the Mississippi was a reasonable candidate. Well, yes, they were, they were looking for mammoths, but all they found were bones. Mm -hmm. They did find a fossil of a, apparently a huge prehistoric fish, which I guess they couldn't really dig out of the bank or they tried to get some of it there on the Missouri, uh, but no remnant of that is known to exist. But Jefferson kept looking and, and wanted to find things. And in 1807, September of 1807, he had William Clark do a major dig at Big Bone Lick in Kentucky, just upriver from Louisville. And it was that dig in which Clark found fossils that uh, definitely identified the mastodon and the mammoth as being two different species. And it's, in fact, the sign there at Big Bone Lick State Park states that it's the birthplace of North American vertebrate paleontology. Uh, so they kept looking. And if they didn't find it out west, by golly, they might find it in the east. I, I, will, I will follow up on that one, by the way. I know that there are some major you know, dinosaur bone sites and the like out in the American West. Uh, did Lewis and Clark actually come near any of the you know, mother loads of your, bo your old bones? Not that I'm aware of. Well, they didn't know that they were close to sources. One of the great sources uh, of, uh, of uh, dinosaur remnants is near the town of Ekalaka, Montana. It has a major uh, museum. And one of the first uh, whole skeletons of a Tyrannosaurus rex uh, was first discovered in eastern Montana. Well, Lewis, uh, Clark went down the Yellowstone River, right past Ekalaka, Montana in 1806, but had no idea that he was near a Tyrannosaurus Rex skeleton. He didn't have his backhoe with him. Uh. 
Thank you. I, just it was just a, a thought to follow up. Um, all right, so a question from Dean Williamson. What would anyone think of this interpretation? One objective was not merely to establish commercial relationships with the tribes, but also to establish something of a free trade zone. And specifically, the tribes, the Sioux, were enthusiastic about extracting a heavy cut of the fur trade from the French traders. Negotiations did get a little fraught, but an accommodation was ultimately secured. Well, I'd make just one suggestion. The US wanted to get rid of England and the Hudson's Bay Company. That was exactly what Jefferson told Congress. But it's interesting, and I believe this is in the Mandan villages, and this is in the uh, journals. Clark told, there were some, pre, there were some uh, Hudson Bay traders there when they showed up. And Clark told him, don't hand out any more of these sovereignty tokens because we're the bosses here but you can stay here and trade until we get back in time. So if you want to call that a free trade zone, it was until the U.S. could take total dominance. But I find that really interesting that on the political side, he told this Hudson Bay agent or whatever he was, trader, don't hand out any more English sovereignty tokens because we've made this Louisiana purchase and we're the overriding sovereign here. I think too, you, uh, you have to look at a map of what we thought the Louisiana Territory uh, included. Uh, because if it's loosely described as all of the west uh, tributaries of the Mississippi River, uh, the Red River, the border between the Dakotas and Minnesota is not a tributary of the, of the Mississippi, it flows north. So that whole area in Minnesota and the Dakotas still belong to the Brits still part of what would become uh, Canada. Uh, and the big trading company at Pembroke was, was a British uh, trading. And it's only 40 miles from the Mandan villages. So uh, they, were, they were not a far away uh, power. And uh, add to what uh, Bob was saying too, is you know, uh, Meriwether Lewis was a real Anglophobe. He, uh, he did not like the British. He kind of like Thomas Jefferson. He didn't like them. I, don't, I maybe won't say he was a, a British or English hater, but uh, he, yeah, he would at, at every opportunity try to try to get them out of that area and tell them they got to stay away. Whereas Clark, as Bob said, he was much more pragmatic and realistic about what the situation was. And he would warn them and kind of say, well, we're coming back but we kind of understand that we can't tell you guys to just disappear. May I add, may I add something here? Because it's intriguing that our, our, our race with England to claim the West and to get the fur trade, et cetera. We all are familiar with Alexander Mackenzie and his trip across Canada. He was a Scotsman, his trip across Canada in 1792 to 93, I believe. And then he publishes a book in 1801. And I have read that Jefferson and, and, and perhaps the listeners don't realize Meriwether Lewis was his private secretary in the White House and lived with Jefferson, just the two of them, for, I, I believe, for two years. But somebody describes them having McKenzie's 1801 book and just being shocked that the English had crossed and had a claim perhaps to the whole Pacific Northwest. They were looking at his map. And, and that was the genesis practically of sending, certainly Lewis says, well, send me, send me. But the idea that this was a diplomatic political issue. And, and that's what a lot of my book is about. And Lewis and Clark being part of the American legal international law claim to own the Oregon country. We used for over 40 years in diplomatic debates with Russia, Spain and England we use the fact of an American finding the Columbia River in first in 1792, then Lewis and Clark crossing from the east and building that Fort Clatsop at the mouth of the Columbia, and then the John Jacob Fur Post that, that Harry just mentioned as a, our legal reasons and our uh, justifications to own the Oregon country under international law. Yeah, McKen Mackenzie's book was called Voyages from Montreal, and it it laid the basis for what Mackenzie thought could be a, a British-based 
economic system in the entire Pacific Northwest, not just in what is now uh, Canada. Uh, and I think when Jefferson read uh, Voyages from Montreal, especially that last chapter, that's one of the three main reasons or causes of the, of the expedition. Uh, yeah, it, uh, one of it's the very... others is the transfer of Louisiana from Spain uh, to France. Uh, and then I think uh, the Spanish closed off commerce on the Mississippi River uh, over the winter of 1803-1804, uh, another, another major reason. Well, it, uh, Mackenzie's book scared the daylights out of, out of Jefferson because Mackenzie flat out says, seize control of the Oregon country and keep the Americans out. We need to dominate, monopolize the fur trade. And, and, and Jefferson eventually saw, as, as the wonderful Lewis and Clark scholar Donald Jackson states in one of his books, he saw America actually stretching in some form of one republic or several all the way to the Pacific. And he thought, oh my gosh, we're gonna be cut off and, and we can't let that happen. So that was indeed a major incentive for finally making sure that an expedition, an American expedition did get out to the West Coast and be able to lay some kind of claim. And it wasn't until, as Bob mentioned, the 1840s, you know, 54, 40 or fight was, you know, one of the, the things we wanted to see if we could push that northern boundary of Canada much farther north. And finally, diplomatically, that line was settled at the present border between. But for many, many years uh, there on the Columbia River, the lower Columbia, it was the British on the north side of the Columbia and the Americans on the south until all that got finally worked out diplomatically. Yes, I live, I'm here in Portland for the summer and John McLaughlin, the famous Hudson Bay factor, the manager of their trade out here, he was down the Columbia, the Willamette River a ways into what's now Oregon, but thinking the line would be drawn, as you just said, Jim, with the Columbia River, he moved just across the river, across the Columbia, to the um, Washington side. So England argued a long time that the Columbia River should have been the dividing line. Well, like you said, we wanted to clear up the tip of Alaska, the 54-40-year fight. I'm going Professor to Miller, are you spending any time at the Powell's Bookstore in Portland? I'm not even sure they're fully open yet. They So... Yes, I go down there when I can. I love the, I always did my research down there. You know, before the internet, I'd go in there and look at their books for free. <laughs> it's, it's a great site. I've been there. It's wonderful. I'm going to seize control of our uh, excursion to Powell's bookstore, which He's I've also been to. It's going to take the power it's of quite, the doctrine of discovery. <laughs> it's quite pleasant. Um, I actually have a question. Um, what about the role of the French American traders and the Metis? Um, I guess related questions. How much were they an object which Jefferson and Americans were considering, you know, in terms of control, still controlling the trade? And then, you know, if France had kept the Louisiana Purchase, were they still in any sense, you know, culturally coherent, uh, having affiliations? with a conceivable reborn French empire, you know, after the, you know, 40 years since 1763, were they just ignored and a non-issue? And what, what, but what is their role in this story? Well, I know the, you know, the, the, the French there in, I'll say St. Louis, the French populace in St. Louis uh, was very important and continued to be quite dominant and influential even after the Americans moved in. And this is something that Lewis and Clark both comment on. As far as the trade, you know, I mentioned Pierre Chouteau leading an Osage delegation east to Washington. The Chouteau family was very prominent and, and important in, in uh, St. Louis politics and Missouri politics, the Louisiana territory politics. Uh, and let us remember, too, that the, the engagés that Lewis and Clark hired to help get the boats upriver to Fort Mandan that first year in 1804, they, for the most part, were all French traders and, and rivermen and uh, had been, some of them were even of mixed parentage, uh, like Pierre Cruzat, uh, 
And so they were, they played an important role early on and many of them, you know, they were, they basically then become recruited by American companies and, uh, and become some of those early mountain men that are, that are then going west in the fur trade. Well, I, I have a comment or two, but remember, I believe the Spanish selling Louisiana to the French was a secret. It happened, I think, in 1800. Jefferson didn't find out till maybe 1801, 1802, and he was terrified. He, I think I can quote this. He wrote that as long as that old man Spain owned it, it was no problem for us. But Napoleon and France is a different problem. And I wonder how many listeners realize that Napoleon sent an army of about 15,000 troops that were supposed to go by Haiti, quell the, the, the slave revolt there, and then go to New Orleans. And of course, I guess the yellow fever and the slave revolt killed this entire army. So that is what led to Napoleon saying, ah, fooey on Louisiana and I'll sell it. Remember, uh, James, is it with James Madison and Robert Livingston were in Paris only to buy Louis, New Orleans. And they were authorized to spend $2 million. All of a sudden, Napoleon says, buy it all for, and this is the figure. And they just did that practically, you know, in those days, you couldn't send a text back and forth. But think if that 15,000 man French army had showed up in New Orleans and the changes that would have been. Yes. Thomas, Thomas Jefferson's favorite word for the Spanish empire in the American West was feeble. It was feeble. It would, it would fall on the first hour of the first war. But France was the most powerful land uh, power, military power on the planet. Uh, and, uh, and to imagine the French ensconced along the thousand mile Western border of the United States was something he could not countenance. Thank you. Um, I am going to go well, with a somewhat uh, a, a follow up on semen, and I'm just going to give you the entire follow up, just you know, for, for you to uh, respond to. You know, uh, Gary Kimsey on semen. One theory is that semen was with Lewis on the venture into Blackfeet territory. After the event, as Lewis and the three others raced away, semen was unable to keep up with the fast ride. Another theory I've heard is that semen survived the expedition. What are your thoughts? About every kid in America, or at least most adults, would like to know what happened to Seaman. He went to sea. I can. <laughs> well, I can. That's actually something I've I've delved into, and you know, for what Lewis and the three men with him were doing in July of '06 to go north into Blackfeet country, that they wouldn't have had a dog with them. I, you know, they were on horseback. They were trying to make good time. Uh, it just doesn't seem practical that they would have had semen with them. The last mention in the journals is there in the in the summer of 06, near the confluence of the Yellowstone and Missouri, in which they talk about semen just howling in frustration and 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 pain at all the mosquitoes and the bugs and everything bothering them. So that's the last mention. But you know, this is something, and we find it odd. Uh, but it's it's routine. I mean, you just I've come to in the thousands of letters and diaries, journals I've read through the years, uh, not only about Lewis and Clark, but but just, you know, historical figures, people in general are the things they don't mention. You know, they're routine. They're commonplace. They just don't even think to mention them. And, you know, semen gets mentioned at more than some of the men do in the journals. Uh, but in, it's usually because he's doing something special, like running the buffalo off in a camp or, or something like that. Uh, but if it's routine, they just don't mention him. And so he disappears. And so some people have speculated uh, that he died or he was in St. Louis. But in 1813, I think it was, 1814, a minister named Timothy Alden uh, published a book on tombstone epitaphs, and and uh, in that book he says he visited the Masonic Museum in Alexandria, Virginia, and came across and was shown a dog collar, and on that dog collar was inscribed 
My name is Seaman, and I'm not going to get the quote exactly right. My name is Seaman, and I accompanied my master, Mary, Captain Meriwether Lewis, to the Pacific and back. And it's like, oh, well, gee, you know, wow, this is something. And then Alden apparently talked to somebody and gives us like the old Paul Harvey stories, the rest of the story. And what he says is that Seaman was with his master, Meriwether Lewis, when he died in Tennessee in 1809, and that he was so faithful, he refused to leave his master's grave and died there at Lewis's grave at, at uh, Grinder Stand along the Natchez Trace. Now, some people say, oh, that's anecdotal, that's apocryphal, you know, we can't really believe that, but, you know, there's no reason to doubt that the collar existed and that somebody who knew, perhaps Clark, who did give some things to the Masonic Museum in 1811, uh, 1812 or so, uh, that this may indeed be Seaman's fate. Do we know for sure? No, but I think actually it's a pretty good bet that that may be indeed what happened. And the fact that Seaman isn't mentioned in any of the descriptions of Lewis's demise there at ground grinder stand doesn't mean that he wasn't there. It's just that dogs were so commonplace, nobody ever thought to really talk about them. So we wish they had, and we might actually know what happened. But if he wasn't with Lewis there on that fateful trip east, my guess is that he was back in St. Louis and that he passed away back there, but post expedition. Some of us, of course, uh, some, of, uh, some of us are old enough to remember when the dog's name was Scannon. That's right. <laughs> uh, but it was, a, it was the historian uh, Ernest Staples Osgood who couldn't figure out why Seaman's Creek existed in western Montana. Mm -hmm. And he went back to the original writing in the journals. And sure enough, you look at Lewis's handwriting, and Seaman makes more sense than Scannon. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think and the, the, the assumption, the usual assumption is uh, that the dog made it back at least to St. Louis. Uh, I don't think he was with Lewis on his uh, last trip. Uh, Clay Jenkins would say that if, that if Seaman was with Lewis, he would never have taken his own life. <laughs> he was a therapy dog. Uh, well, maybe, well, maybe so. <laughs> and we don't know where Lewis got Seaman. You know, he, he has him in Pittsburgh, but as well-trained and as loyal as he seemed to be, it seems like he should have had him longer than just getting him that summer in Pittsburgh, but who knows? Did he get him in Philadelphia? Did he have him back in Washington? You know, who knows? But we know that he did have him when he sets out from Phil, uh, from Pittsburgh in August of 1803. Well, there, are, uh, we know, there are several histories of the expedition written by seamen. That's right. We should probably read those. Yeah, there's a, there's a whole string of books. <laughs> yeah, but Harry, it's only in a third grade level. Okay. <laughs> I'm actually going to extend that question a little bit. I, dogs in general, I mean, in effect, how common were they when you were going out exploring? Um, you know, would every French trader have had a dog? Was it actually a rare thing for, you know, a dog to go out like this? Or would you have just expected this to happen? Well, I just have a joke. If you had a dog out in the West, Lewis and Clark and the expedition would have eaten it. <laughs> Unless its name was Seaman, yes. Exactly. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Lewis but claimed it, to prefer dog meat to venison. Mm -hmm. But there's, but uh, we don't have a sense of like just how common were dogs accompanying people as they went on, you know, I mean, the dogs were common. I mean, they were around and I don't know, I don't really know how often they would accompany, let's say, exploring parties and that, but they turn up, you know, with people moving west, you know, they have dogs with them and they could be good guard dogs. They could be, you know, with a family pet, but uh, they were pretty common uh, on the frontier. Native Americans had dogs. I mean, yep. Lewis and Clark would buy them dozens at a time from Indian tribes. 
especially on the Columbia. No. Yes, I, didn't they eat like 250 dogs in the West? I'm not sure the precise number, but that sounds about right. Yeah. Well, and then they're almost, you know, Lewis comes to blows there along the Columbia with one when he tosses uh, a puppy at him and kind of makes fun of him for eating dog. And uh, Lewis does not react well to that. <laughs> I may just follow up the slightest bit. So, so for the um, uh, Native American nations on horseback, I mean, was there any difficulty with horse dogs keeping up with them as they traveled on horseback? Usually it was a village moving and and so they you know they had the travoy and women and children and they were all picking up. I would think and the other guys can maybe speak to this more specifically, but I think war parties, especially war parties on horseback, often you know they wouldn't have the dogs with them trying to keep up probably. All right. Sorry, uh, Lewis, sorry. And, Lewis and Clark were on uh, horseback on the way back. Uh, from around uh, the mouth of the Columbia River all the way across the Bitterroot uh, Mountains. Uh, they had horses. Nobody, nobody was riding those horses except maybe Sacagawea or Gibson, was it, who had a, uh, who had a bad back? The uh, Bratton, yeah. Bratton had the bad back. Uh, so th they're, not, they're not going fast. So the dog could easily have kept up with the party as it made its way uh, on horseback. Can I ask you two this question, uh, especially Harry, without old Toby to guide them through the bitter roots, Lewis and Clark would either have died or would never have made it to Oregon. Do you think that's? I regard old Toby uh, as of equal importance with Sacagawea in getting the Lewis and Clark expedition out of Idaho and on the road over the Bitterroot Mountains to the Columbia watershed. He's, he's of critical importance in that, in that, at that point. Yeah, I mean, the fact of the matter is if the native peoples hadn't cooperated and helped Lewis and Clark, they never, they never would have gotten halfway up to Missouri. <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, the Teton Sioux could have easily have stopped. In fact, Jefferson had said, you know, if you're threatened, if, if it's between death or, or continuing the expedition, uh, don't take chances, turn around and come yeah, home. Again. Awesome. And, uh, and they didn't always follow that directive, but they uh, pressed on. But yeah, the native, I mean, you know, this is, this is the history as we were talking about in, in Indian and tribal lands uh, earlier. I mean, you know, uh, once once the numbers got on the Anglo-American, Euro-American side and they started sweeping across the continent, uh, you know, the fate of the native peoples was pretty much sealed. And if if the, the tribes that Lewis and Clark encountered had realized what was going to follow and that these guys were kind of opening up the door to doom for them and their way of life, uh, they probably would have said, okay, that's it for you guys. I have read, you know, part of what Jefferson told Lewis and Clark to do was to recruit chiefs to come back to DC and stuff. So that was part of the diplomatic mission, but also to impress Indian peoples, what you just said, Jim, how mm -hmm. strong the United States was and how many Americans there were. And what I have read, I don't know if this is, you know, historically established, but when these chiefs returned and told them about Americans living on top of each other in apartments, I suppose, and how many they were, the, as many as the stars in the sky, Indian people just didn't even believe these chiefs. Mm -hmm. So that, that's an interesting twist on what you just said. Thank you. Um, I have another question from the audience, which I'm going to pass on, uh, from Dean Williamson. Uh, how did Sacagawea end up in St. Louis, you know, or, or wherever, I, I, I'm quoting, uh, how did she get separated from her uh, clan? Well, she, go ahead, Harry. Shoshone, she was, uh, she was captured near Three Forks, Montana, probably around uh, 1799, when she might have been about 10 years old, 10 or 11 years old, uh, captured by the Hidatsa uh, and taken back to uh, 
the middle of uh, modern North Dakota. And then she did actually. The, the interesting question is, she she did not return to the Shoshone, either on the way out to the Pacific with Lewis and Clark or on the way back. And she did, you know, after the expedition reaches the Mandan Hadatsa villages again in August of 1806, Clark actually, when they part, they stay there and the Corps goes on down river. Uh, Clark actually wanted to take uh, little Jean Baptiste Pomp with him uh, and raise him as his own son. He was so attached to him. And, uh, and uh, the Charbonneau said, no, thank you. Well, he's going to stay with us. But we do know that the family did visit Clark at least once in St. Louis. And, and when Sakakawea ends up dying in December of 1812, uh, there up on the North South Dakota border uh, at a trading post, uh, that Charbonneau eventually does get the, both uh, Lisette, the little girl who had been born later, and uh, Jean Baptiste down to St. Louis and Clark become, is appointed their guardian. And uh, Lizette kind of disappears and I think died really young, uh, really young anyway. And, but of course, Jean Baptiste goes on and has this incredible career, not only in the West, but over in Europe when he uh, uh, accompanies Prince Max back to, uh, to uh, Germany. I just want to say something. This is colloquial, I suppose, but I saw a very interesting and very vigorous argument at a conference at the Buffalo Bill Museum in October 02 between, I guess, some Mandan women and some Shoshone women arguing about what nation Sacagawea was really from. <laughs> and I have seen some anecdotal evidence again that she didn't die so young and that she lived to be quite old. So I don't know what historians think of those last two facts or those two points. Well, that's, that's, that's interesting, Bob, because it is. It's still debated today. And they say, you know, she died as an incredibly old woman on the Wind River Reservation in, in Wyoming. Uh, but uh, that, you know, thanks to, I think it's Grace Hebert that, that wrote the book and, and, and you know, uh, that kind of puts that in there. They have a monument to her out there. Uh, but when you look at, at Clark becoming the guardian and his, uh, one of his traders who's up at that post when she dies, he's, he comments that, uh, you know, she had, she had passed away, not by name, but he, he says the, the snake or Shoshone woman, the wife of Charbonneau, uh, and then the kids are in St. Louis and, and Clark is appointed their guardian. It just really makes sense. And he, in his 1820 circus 27 account book in which he lists the members of the expedition, he lists her as being dead. Uh, and he was in a position to know that. And so that's, you know, that's what uh, is, you know, I think for most historians, the real tipping is that he, he knew, he was in a position to know, and so that she did indeed die, as so many of these expedition veterans did, died young and died not all that long after the expedition. So I'll tell you a very interesting, and this makes me think of this, Bob, and, and the question of uh, you know how could she be claimed and what happened to her, when did she die, is I was, actually it was at uh, University of Montana uh, back during the bicentennial, Harry, and I was uh, part of a, a, a seminar there, and I gave a talk on York during the expedition. And York, of course, William Clark's enslaved African Americans, one of my areas of specialty. And so I gave my talk, and a man, Dan Hadadza, comes up to me after, after the talk, very, very polite. And he says, well, of course, you know, there was no black man with Lewis and Clark. And I was, of course, rather stunned by this. And I said, oh, there wasn't? And he said, well, no. He says, "My this is the importance of oral tradition. My clan has no tradition of a black man being with Lewis and Clark. So there was no black man with Lewis and Clark. And mm -hmm. I said, well, perhaps your clan didn't encounter him. Because I said, it's in the journals. Other clans, you know, do, you know, he is in, in, oral history, oral tradition for other native peoples. 
So I said, you know, I, I have to believe that York was indeed on the expedition. And he just kind of smiled and shook his head. And he said, well, he said, I, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a question for you, Jim. You mentioned how young so many of the men were or when they died. Is that because of the lead medical instruments that Lewis and Clark <laughs> Yeah, getting getting dosed with uh, mercury and and everything else could have been part of it. That and and deciding they're going to go out west and engage in a very dangerous oh. occupation called fur trapping. Right. No, it's <laughs> called invasion and trespass. That's what That's they. That's right. <laughs> so the, the average lifespan of a, trespass. <laughs> the average lifespan of an American male at that time was about forty five years. Right. So that's why my hero is Patrick Gass, yeah. the last surviving <laughs> member of the Lewis and Clark right. expedition, yep. lived past the Civil War and died at age 99. Wow. And, and married very late and had children. And one of his, believe this or not, one of his grandsons just died not all that long ago. Mm. Mm. Yes, they used, used to come to the conferences. The, That's right, the yes. Uh -huh. The painters, yeah, the painter family, yes. Uh huh. Thank you. Um, I'm actually going to say, so it's 3.26 p.m. We're approaching the witching hour where I should ask you, each of you, if you'd be so kind uh, for you know, a last you know, minute or so final statement, just to uh, close off our wonderful uh, webinar. Um, I guess the same order, if, if you'd be so kind then. Uh, so pr Professor Fritz first. Oh, thank you. And thank you all for uh, watching and hopefully learning something in the last uh, couple of uh, hours. Uh, the Lewis and Clark expedition, I think, uh, probably reached the height of its fame during the bicentennial from 2003 till 2006. Uh, interest has dropped off uh, uh, somewhat in the expedition, uh, but the emphasis has, has changed. Um, we are now asking what impact Lewis and Clark had on the future. Uh, I don't think they had all that much impact. Uh, they lived in a, in a different culture uh, than the American culture that appeared in the, Jacksonian, uh, in the Jacksonian period. But the emphasis has shifted from the explorers to the Native Americans that they encountered all along the way. And we now we now ask what Lewis and Clark thought about the Indians. We ask what the Indians thought about Lewis and Clark uh, and how uh, they, uh, the expedition might have influenced uh, their behavior. So there's a lot of questions uh, left to be uh, uh, risen and answered uh, about the Lewis and Clark uh, expedition. Um, Clark is becoming uh, more notable even than Lewis, I suspect, at the tercentennial uh, in uh, 20, what is it, 100 years or it'll be the Clark and Lewis expedition. <laughs> well, well you, know, you know, Harry, there's that wonderful Larson ca cartoon from the far side, and he clamps on to Lewis and Clark. He has like four different Lewis and Clark cartoons. And one of them is Clark's mother standing behind him while he's writing in the journals. And she says, there it is, or he's reading a newspaper. He's like, there it is again, there it is again. Lewis and Clark expedition. If you don't get busy, it's gonna go down in history as the Lewis and Clark expedition. <laughs> Larson, uh, Clark, being, a Clark, being a Clark, a Clark Ophile, I'm I, I'm going with Lewis and, and the Clark and Lewis expedition. I, <laughs> <laughs> I would just say for my closing comment, David, that uh, yeah, this has been a real pleasure, and it's always great to connect with, with uh, fellow Lewis and Clark historians and with interested people. Uh, but it was, I mean, it was one of the great American adventures. You know, uh, Stephen Ambrose called it the, the American Odyssey. And uh, it was a, 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 a wonderful adventure, a wonderful undertaking. And there is still so much we can study and learn from it today across a broad spectrum of, uh, of disciplines, you know, that it can be taught in schools and to intra history enthusiasts and what have you. And so I think going forward, hopefully we can keep learning. I mean, it's uh, the, uh, the We Proceeded On, which is the journal of the 
of the Lewis and Clark Trail Heritage Foundation. Uh, I mean, every, every issue for a year has more articles about Lewis and Clark, more books, as we all know, since we've written some of them, there's more. And so there's more to be discovered that's out there. And, uh, and so hopefully all of us uh, will keep, uh, keep at it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for having me on the program. I enjoyed it. Uh, there's no question that Lewis and Clark accomplished a superhuman task. One person dying, then of course the encounter with the Blackfeet youth. But I would get tired driving across the continent and they walked and rode, <laughs> and, you know, whatever. But the message I want to end with is the Bicentennial wanted tribal participation. The 500 year anniversary of Columbus had no tribal interest. But the, the Lewis and Clark Bicentennial and then their commission, they really approached tribal governments and tribal governments were not interested in being involved if this was some kind of celebration. And I think the Bicentennial Commission purposely said, we're not, we will not use the word celebration. This is a commemoration. And we do want you to be involved to help us tell a more full story so 41 tribal nations finally appointed, and I was appointed by my tribe to the circle of tribal advisors, and the message the tribal nations and Indian peoples wanted to deliver to Americans, we are still here. And so that's interesting, Harry, that you think the, the whole focus now, at least now, is more on the tribal response and reaction and interaction. So that message, we are still here, is what tribal peoples wanted delivered. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, so thank you to everybody who participated. Thank you to our audience for coming and listening. Um, I will say that we will be having more of these. Um, uh, there, there is a constant series of history going, I suppose we'll get up ultimately to 2021 or 2022 by the time we're finished. Uh, we also have a parallel webinar series on the great American novel. Uh, that's also proceeding. We've um, the last one was actually Wallace Stegner, uh, Angle of Repose for similar territory um, out West. There's actually like a synergy going on here this season. Um, but so please uh, continue to watch our uh, webinars, both for American history and for American literature and indeed everything else we do. Um, and you get, will have a chance to watch this one on the YouTube National Association of Scholars YouTube channel again within 24 hours. And if you have any remaining questions for our panelists, send them to me, randall at nas.org, uh, and I will forward them to them. And they will, you know, I suppose answer them rather than just tossing them into their trash of uh, their email boxes. They're, they seem like nice people. So. We will respond even if we don't know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> we will make one up. That's right. Make it up with the best of them. So look, so anyway, thank you again so very much. It's been a wonderful time with you this afternoon and yeah, it's a great pleasure personally. And um, gosh, we should do another one on Lewis and Clark. <laughs> so take care of yourselves. And I think we're ending now. All right. Thank you. Thank you.